Evening Cayman Rock, evening Grand Cayman, evening Cayman Islands. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, four years ago, they called me the quiet one. Four years later, I'm still the quiet one. But I don't waste time talking foolishness. When I come, I come with facts. And I come to inform so that on May 24th, you all can make informed decisions. Vote straight. PPM. All the way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as Minister of Finance, my responsibility is to ensure that the country's revenue and expenditure is in such a state that the country is able to do all the things that are necessary to govern for the good of the people and to ensure that the country and the people continue to prosper. Now, there are services to be provided. There is debt to be repaid. There is infrastructure to be built. And I have the difficult task of making sure that my colleagues don't get too carried away in their zeal to do a better job than they have all been doing. The fact is, there are many people out there who would have you believe that the way you run a country is to spend without thinking and then go and borrow afterwards. The government's finances are no different from the way you manage your own finances within your own home. If you don't do it properly, at the end of the day, you find yourself in great difficulty. My job is to make sure that we have sufficient funds for everything that we need to do. But it comes with managing the economy. Money does not grow on trees. And as we have learned in the last couple years gone by, you cannot borrow your way out of trouble. When you find yourself in financial difficulties, you don't run off and borrow without thought. You sit back, you think, you think wisely, and then you act. The only way to get your country out of debt is to grow your economy. Money does not grow on trees. You grow your economy. From economic growth, you derive revenue. When the economy grows, your revenue increases. And then you seek to control expenditure. And by doing both of those, you then create a surplus. Many people will talk, but few will understand. You know, it's unfortunate that we don't put people through a test before they can go and be nominated. Because many would be disqualified before the nomination process. There should have to be a common sense test. Not an academic test, but a common sense test. Knowing what to do is vastly different from talking about it. Because if the people make the mistake and put you in a position after you've talked about it but had no clue as to what to do, then only the people and the country will suffer. You know, Bob Marley has a song. The title of the song, I think, is Could You Be Loved? But there are lyrics in the song that says, don't let them fool you or even rearrange you because they want to fool you for their own purposes. You've seen those purposes before. You know what to expect. Don't let them fool you or even rearrange you. 
Could you be loved and be loved? Ladies and gentlemen, I do what I do for love of country. This isn't an easy job. Many things are said about you. It takes time from your family. Many of us are professionals. We do not do this job because we need the money. We do this job because the country needs good governance. When we took office in 2013, we had a very simple but effective plan. Our strategy was to regrow, was to grow our economy, stabilize the government's finances, and in so doing, then look to reduce taxes. The plan was simple but very effective. The first thing we did, knowing full well that we could not go and borrow our way out of the situation that we were in, we knew we had to grow the economy. But you don't just flick a switch and grow an economy. You put in place sensible policies and you demonstrate competence. And you create an environment where people trust you believe that you know what you are doing and therefore are willing to put their money in your country under your influence and believe that with good governance, their investment will grow and they will receive a return on their investment. Ladies and gentlemen, our simple plan included control wasteful expenditure. In our first two years, in the first year, the UK government wanted us to reduce expenditure by $25 million. Within a week of being sworn into office, the Premier, myself, and the, Dep and the Financial Secretary traveled to the UK. We met with the UK Foreign, Foreign and Commonwealth Office economists. And ladies and gentlemen, we didn't go there to argue. We went there to influence, and we went there to demonstrate our knowledge and our competence, and by so doing, influence. They wanted us to reduce expenditure by $25 million in the first year. Their belief is that the civil service was costing the country too much. We said to them, we hear what you're saying, but please understand that if we do as you are saying, then you will throw the country back into recession. Ladies and gentlemen, one economist speaking to another, we understood each other. There was no argument. It was simple, common sense, decency, and respect. They agreed. We then reduced expenditure in the first year by approximately $15 million. And then in the next year, we reduced it by another 18 or so million dollars. Over the two-year period, we were able to reduce expenditure to the level that they were happy with. But by controlling expenditure, we also helped to grow the surplus that they were asking us to do, which was required by law. Now, we didn't cut we did not cut one job. Not one civil servant lost their job. We did not cut one job. We did not cut expenditure on social benefits. We looked for the ways in which we could cut wasteful spending. They were there. They were there to the tune of about $28 million. We found them, we cut them, we did not affect one job. We did not affect services to those who were in need. So we controlled wasteful expenditure. We promised no new taxes. We reduced taxes. You recall we reduced the duty on diesel 
that is used by CUC to produce electricity. It has had a tremendous benefit to people, significantly reduced utility bills. As I said before, we instill confidence in our ability to govern the country. Investment increased. That created jobs. When people got jobs, they were able to spend money. When they spent more money, the economy grew. When the economy grew, the revenue to the government grew. We knew how to increase the revenue, how to grow the economy without doing foolishness. To say it plainly. Without being reckless, we knew what to do. The result, we increased economic growth and we increased government revenue. In 2013, when we took office, and ladies and gentlemen, my time is short, so I'll speak rapidly. In 2013, when we took office, the economy was growing at 1.5%. In 2014, that rate of growth accelerated from 1.5% to 2.2%. In 2015, it accelerated even more, from 2.2% to 2.8%. And in 2016, it is estimated that it will be another 2.8%. Ladies and gentlemen, when you find your rate of economic growth accelerating, it is not by chance. It is because people understand this is a place to do business. This government knows what they're doing, and they are ignoring all of the anti-government rhetoric. I want to speak briefly about the importance of financial stability. We are now in an environment of stable finances. When we took office, we didn't know if the country would be able to pay its bills. But as I've said before, we knew what to do, we set about doing it. Now the importance of financial stability is that we are now in full compliance with the framework for fiscal responsibility as it stands in the public management and finance law. That required that we have 90 days of revenue put aside so that if anything happens in the country, the country is able to pay its expenses for at least 90 days. We have surpassed the 90 days. As I've said before, investor confidence. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot underestimate investor confidence. There is a company called Moody's Rating Agency. What Moody's does, it looks at companies, it looks at countries, it assesses their financial information, and it decides whether or not they are a trustworthy, they are investment grade, they are a company or a country that they would recommend that people invest in that country. The Cayman Islands has a stable financial rating. The only thing preventing us from increasing our rating from a double A3 to a double A2, or even all the way to just a straight A, is the size and diversification, not the size of the economy, sorry, the diversification of our economy. And this government is committed to finding sensible ways of diversifying our economy. The other benefit of having financial stability is that you are able to budget and you know that you can provide the services that you have budgeted for. Citizens can reasonably expect to receive the services that they need. And when the government sets its budget, you can go forth knowing full or well you can provide the service to your citizens, your constituents, and everyone else who looks at those services. And with financial stability, ladies and gentlemen, you can promise and then keep your promise of no new taxes. We didn't just promise no new taxes. 
we actually went further. We reduced the taxes. We reduced the diesel on CUC. We reduced the import duty. And we have even more to do. And we will talk about that later on. But I'm out of time. Vote straight. PPM, May 24th. <laughs>